Let's start today's round table. I would like to now introduce our first uh, speaker and panelist, Joshua Pierce. He is currently Richard White Professor of Material Science and Engineering at the, Univers at the Michigan Technological University, where he runs the Open Sustainability, Sustainability Technology Research Group, as well as actually a, visitor, a visiting professor in multiple international universities. Um, he's also editor-in-chief of Hardware X, a journal dedicated to open source scientific hardware. And interestingly, you just had a special issue welcoming submissions on open medical uh, design. So over to you, Joshua. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Christina. It truly is a pleasure to be here. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd kind of kick it off by just doing some basic introductory um, information about the kind of decisions that you need to make when you want to share your uh, work dealing with COVID-19 projects. And so um, because most of the projects that we're considering are medical devices, uh, you have to think a little bit about what type of medical device it is and how you want it to be shared. So I'm assuming everyone here, everybody listening is working on some sort of medical device and they would like to have it manufactured. And the question is, is do you want it manufactured um, in a normal kind of conventional centralized manner where you might be have uh, already teamed up with a device manufacturer that makes a similar device now, or you know, there's car companies making ventilators, you're already working with someone that can mass produce something. Uh, the other way, and this is kind of what, what the pandemic, if there's a bright spot that's come out of the pandemic, is that distributed manufacturing has really taken off. And the concept behind distributed manufacturing is that we all make whatever we need. And that might be done even at the household scale, but maybe more, slightly more realistically and kind of what fits more into the wiki factory mold is that it's done at a makerspace or a fab lab. And so it's, you're making a design and you're sharing it so that many groups can, can start to manufacture it. So you have to decide kind of which path you wanna go down or perhaps you wanna to try to do, do both at the same time. Now, the second one is you have to determine the regulatory requirements for your specific area where you're making it. So for, for me, for example, in the US, it's usually the FDA that I have to make sure that I'm kind of following their rules. And then the, the third one is to determine if, if you can actually do it. Um, and the, the reason for that is not so much whether you not you can make it. Like I, I have faith in our maker skills. We can all make things. Uh, but we have to make it in a certain way to make it acceptable to the regulatory agency that we're working with. So for example, even just a very simple thing, um, anything that you're making that involves electronics that has some sort of power supply that's plugged into a wall. In the US, there's a huge number of regulations if it's a metal device, medical device, and it plugs into the wall. And you know, when you're just making something like say a 3D printer, you don't really worry so much about that. You just you know, buy, buy a power supply, you know it's gonna be good at 60 Hertz and all, everything's good. But to be able to manufacture something and give it to a hospital, uh, you have to make sure that you're following those requirements. And so oftentimes like kind of making that jump from I can make something that works to make something that can actually be used, it's a, it's a large leap. It's something that uh, is, is non-trivial. It's, it's challenging. So I wanna give you the perspective from the digital, the distributed manufacturing standpoint. And so um, the kind of the, the, the most positive sort of inspirational um, what method of helping people that sort of come out of this from a technical perspective is, is 3D printing. Uh, you know, we've all known that 3D printers are pretty useful if you've ever had one, but I think that the general consensus among the population is they just couldn't understand what they would use it for. So I'm talking to like my father-in-law and I'm talking about all the great things that 3D printers can do. He's like, well, what would I use it for? Like, what, what would I ever make with it? And it wasn't really until the pandemic when people said like, oh, I understand, like this is a manufacturing device that can't just make one thing, it can make dozens or hundreds or thousands or even millions of things, as long, uh, even if you're not particularly technically skilled, as long as the, des the designs are, are shared for free. And so 3D printing has been very effective in this because there's enough 3D printers out there now that um, the community of 3D printers and makers have been able to respond to the shortage in supplies, most notably of PPE during the pandemic. And so, um, a lot, of, a lot of designs started sprouting up all over the place, many of which are perfectly good, some of which are a little bit questionable. And the idea of uh, we needed some good solid way to start validating them. Now, one way is you just make it and test it yourself. Um, but another approach that I, I think has been particularly effective is the NIH, which is the largest funder 
of all research in the United States, the National Institute of Health, um, they have a 3D print exchange. And so they've sort of been a sort of a head of the curve now for a while where they have, uh, it's a repository that's controlled by a government agency that, um, you know, make sure that there's not garbage. It's not, they're not trying to sell you anything. It's just giving you free uh, designs and uh, an ability to share your designs. Now, in terms of comparing it to other 3D printing repositories, it's pretty small. It's not as slick. It, it, it doesn't have any fancy features in it, uh, but it's okay. It's a, it's a reasonably good repository. However, when the pandemic hit, uh, they created a special collection of designs that were pre-validated where they printed them out, they tested them, and they said whether they're available for clinical use, whether they're available for the community use, or whether they're still kind of in the queue. And so that has given a lot of uh, hospitals and um, medical directors and, and things that are making decisions on whether or not to allow a specific thing into their hospital, even if it's, you know, kind of gets a pass from the FDA approval, uh, they can go to the, the NIH repository and know that somebody who's a medical professional has taken a look at it and said, you know, this thing actually might not be so bad and might be useful. And so that has allowed millions and millions of uh, 3D printed things to be used in the, during the pandemic at hospitals that were having trouble getting supplies from more conventional manufacturers. Um, when you're doing something like, like this, one of the things, particularly now, is that you have to make sure that the 3D printing that you're using is appropriate. Uh, so we all know that 3D printing is, has a, a lot of porosity associated with it, and there was a chance that in some types of designs, you'd actually be um, possibly harming the person that you're trying to help. And so you want to make sure that they can be cleaned and used in some way. And so um, for some of, some of many of the designs, you can clean them chemically, and there's also sterilization methods that are available in most hospitals, uh, usually a chemical or heat-based uh, treatment. And um, like there's been a lot of... Um, I would say, acceleration to push technologies that weren't quite there yet out. And so one of the ones that, that my group worked on was a high temperature 3D printer. Uh, there's lots of three, high temperature 3D printers out there on the market. And so these are printers that can print things above polycarbonate. So things like Altem, uh, PEI, uh, PEC, those types of materials. And what's nice about those materials is you can sterilize them in an oven. And so if you're thinking about uh, PPE equipment where you want to be able to reuse it day after day, and you wanna make sure that it's clean, like, like the whole idea with a face mask is the outer surface of the face mask becomes contaminated. So if you touch it, you contaminate your hand and then you, know, you can get yourself sick. And if you're in a location like a, a ward in a hospital where there's a, a many people suffering from, from COVID-19, you can assume that like your entire outer surface is completely covered with, with virus. And so the last thing you want is a uh, virus uh, to be kind of inside your your PPE and that you're going to try to reuse the next day and, and contaminate yourself when you put it on. And so one of the ways that you can sterilize it um, is with an autoclave or a high temperature system. And so if people are going to be doing this themselves, um, they need access to high temperature 3D prints. Those systems are, are very expensive, starting kind of $50,000 on up. And that the whole idea of having distributed manufacturing that has been so successful at some of the other things like face shields, the, the throwaway items, um, doesn't work um, for, for a different class. And so we designed a high temperature 3D printer that you can make yourself for $1,000. It's under review now, and I'll talk about why that's necessary, but you can get the designs now and start building it yourself. Um, there's nothing that that's, would, would stop you from doing it. And what makes it unique is all the electronic parts, uh, the stepper motors, everything that doesn't like high heat is on the outside, uh, outside to the exterior of an insulated core that you need in order to make sure that you, you don't have delamination of the 3D print. And so this was a technology we've been working on for years, and suddenly it became really necessary to push it forward very fast. So we put some serious effort into it, and we have something that's a, a pretty reasonable design. Um, as another example of why you might want to use a different method of regulation. And so if you have large backers, your medical device manufacturer already, it's, it's I want to say it's easy to go through FDA approval, but you at least know what you're doing. Uh, but for some devices, like the nasal swab, uh, the FDA has it rated as a device that they kind of take a pass on. They're not going to say whether it's useful or not. And really all this is is a Q-tip rate. And so they, they say, we're not regulating this at all. But when you look, when you dig down into the, the, um, the actual rules, if you're going to man manufacture a medical device, you have to be listed as an FDA-like approved facility. And so even though the device isn't, the place that it is, it has to be. 
And so many, many, many people um, have been working on 3D printed related nasal swabs. And many of them had already been doing this before and they, they were under patent protection. And uh, to their credit, many have, have shared their the designs. And I would say that there's at least a dozen or so different types of designs out there now by big universities and um, kind of major 3D printing manufacturers that were on kind of on the SLA high resolution type 3D printing. And that the problem with this, this whole system now, and the reason that the swabs hasn't taken off as, as much as say the face masks is not as many people have access to SLA printers, but even those that do have to get their facilities rated in order to be able to manufacture them. But then it gets slightly worse. So if I just talk about the US case, so it's only one country where the federal body has said, we're not gonna regulate these things. The state body has to decide how they're going to, to deal with it. So if I take the example of Michigan, um, you know, the, the regulators that were in charge of nasal swabs had never even heard of 3D printers before. And they saw like hundreds of 3D printed objects, like how are they supposed to regulate this? How do they know whether, you know, if person A or company B prints this exact same design, it's gonna be the same. Like they, they were just freaked out. And so the way that they have made their decision is they went to the peer reviewed literature and there's a really nice study that, that came out. And I think they compared 48 different types of designs for 3D printed um, nasal swabs and they got collections. So they had, they kind of opened it up to the community. They have a, a community on GitHub. They asked them to send their designs. They tested the designs. They put it in this paper. And then the state of Michigan used that paper to said, we're only gonna look at the ones that passed this test already. And out of the 48, they chose three to actually do clinical trials on this so that we can use in Michigan. And so that was still, you know, with all of this potential, like you could have lots and lots of people helping on it and we do need it. So in, in my own region, until very recently, you couldn't get a test even if you were sick. And so one of my own students felt that she had the disease, was not able to get testing because we just didn't have enough swabs. Swabs was the, the, the sticking point. And so, um, what we've done and what many other groups have done is come up with a 3D printable swab. The one that we did is completely 3D printable and we wanted to go down to a lower cost uh, printer. And so we used uh, a, the SL1 from Prusa, which is much lower cost, which kind of opens it up so it's accessible to everybody else, it's open source. But the problem with it is you couldn't fit all the other designs on it. It just wasn't quite long enough. You could do it diagonally, but that'd be a huge waste of time. And so uh, we made a shorter version and the shorter version is such that it's made in two different components. One is SLA, the high resolution that you need for the part that goes in your nose, and then a handle. And so the handle you can print on any kind of repress class, class 3D printer. And this, this swab is now going um, clinical trials internally. And we've published or we've published the preprint of the design. So the idea is that we would get on that list that then could go to the uh, regulatory agencies within our own state. And at the same time, we're doing a clinical trial so that when they, they give the green light, we already have all the evidence that's necessary. And that brings me to, to my last slide and how uh, we think we might be able to help you. So I'm the editor-in-chief, uh, co-editor-in-chief of HardwareX. And I'm also on the board of the Journal of Open Source Hardware. And both of these journals currently have ongoing COVID-19 special issues. Uh, for the HardwareX version, and this is a, um, it's a journal published by Asivir, so it's well established we're one of the highest ranks in uh, chemical devices for for any type of, of technology uh, we it's completely open access and we're having a special issue on COVID-19 now the only thing the main requirement that you must have in order to be able to get published in hardware X is you can only publish open hardware if you don't give an open license to your thing we're not interested in looking at your stuff uh, normally we charge $500 as a article processing fee, but for the COVID-19 special issue, there is no charge. And so that means you get free open access with no cost whatsoever. And we're guaranteeing rapid academic peer review. And so as soon as it comes in, it's going out to many uh, potential referees at the same time, and we're pushing them hard to get the reviews back in as fast as possible. Uh, we have rolling publishing so that as soon as an article is accepted, it'll be put up online. And at the same time, we're encouraging all the authors to submit their um, preprints to preprint servers so people can look at it. Uh, the, the overall deadline is in September of 2020, so you still got time to send something in. And I strongly would encourage anyone that wants to take that first step in validating their, their device through the peer review so that you can kind of, if, if you're not ready to go all the way to say FDA approval, you can do this and then encourage other people to jump on that might have the manufacturing wherewithal to be able to do that. Uh, at the same time, the Journal of Open Hardware also has a special issue out. 
And uh, again, their same basic idea, you have to make sure that your devices are open. Uh, if you do not want to share your device openly, then you would want to look at some of the other um, non-open source based journals. So I think I'll, I'll stop here and stop sharing my screen and pass it back Wonderful, to you. Wonderful, Joshua. What great contributions. I look forward to following the progression of, of this special issue. And honestly, congratulations on accelerating the high temp prep app. Amazing. And I would love to take that, take a look at it.